Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church, and happy Resurrection Sunday. It's good to see all of you. You don't have on your Easter bonnets, but you look wonderful to me, and it's great to see all of you. Glad to be able to be up here in front of you and breathing. I'm doing better. Thank you for your prayers. The funeral home quit calling this week and asking how I was doing, so I'm grateful for God's blessings. It's good to see you all. On this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, which we do here every week, by the way, just a side note, especially today, I want to welcome all who are visiting with us. We're delighted to have you. Welcome those who are joining us online. If you're watching by camera, I'm sorry. I look even worse in person, so bear with it. (laughs) But please know that you're welcome as we join together in the worship of our great and gracious God. I do need to make some announcements. I don't feel like doing that today. I just want to celebrate, but let me convey some information to you that is of importance. Uh, Primarily, uh, those of you who are members of the congregation, especially though anyone is welcome to attend, we will have our annual congregational meeting coming up on Wednesday, April the 10th. So not this coming Wednesday, but the one following. And among the other matters that you will be uh, receiving information concerning You also will be voting on elder nominees, George Kilpatrick, Tom Lynch, and Pete Roberts. So please be in prayer for that meeting, which will be at 6 o'clock on April the 10th. Anyone is welcome to attend, but please, we ask that only members vote. No IDs required, but still, we trust you and ask you to be here, and it's an important time in our church's life. You can chuckle. It's okay. Uh, There is going to be some disruption going on for the next few weeks. Our interior of the building will be painted, um, and so some of our meetings might end up moving around a little bit and not looking exactly like they normally do, and, you know, Presbyterians can do that. So just please bear with us as you see the schedule of activities, including the ladies' Bible study schedule for Wednesday at 10. Um, We will not have a Thursday evening Bible study this coming week. The following Thursday, for those who are interested in church membership or just wanting to know what it means to be a member of a local church, I will be offering a class that evening for anyone who would like to attend. And there's no obligation for you. You might have already joined. Uh, Maybe you're not necessarily interested in becoming a member, but you want to know more about it. Or maybe you're anxious and you want to join. We'll, We'll accommodate you. And that will be uh, the following Thursday, not this one coming up, but the one following, which I believe is about the 18th or thereabouts uh, that evening. You're welcome to come. Very important announcement here as well. Next Sunday, just disregard what the front of your bulletin says right there. Next Sunday, we will go back to one morning service, 10 o'clock. We will not have 9 and 11. We will meet at 10. Now, I suspect we're going to be pretty crowded, but it's okay. We can squeeze in. We'll do whatever we need to, but please know the schedule. That's our plan, and want to make sure you are fully aware of that. And no Sunday school, either today or next week, as Dr. Poland and Jean will be out of town next Sunday. So today and next week, no Sunday school. And, of course, our Sunday evening services have concluded. So, those are the things I'm thinking of and can tell you about. Pastor, Rachel, anything else that we need to mention or anyone else? Going once, going twice. How can we ever say words that are adequate? As we consider today the very reason for our being here, a Savior who lived, who suffered and bore the wrath and endured the death that we deserve and gained a victory we could never earn. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Let us worship our risen Christ.
Good morning. I invite you to join me in the responsive reading of our call to worship. This can be found in the inside cover of your bulletin or on the screens. This is taken from Matthew 28, 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. The day of resurrection. Let's stand together and sing. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, in the boundless depths of your unfathomable love and grace, you from the beginning of time orchestrated the miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection. We approach your throne this radiant Easter morning with hearts full of gratitude and joy, profoundly moved by the mystery and the overwhelming beauty of life triumphing over death. As it is written, he is not here for he has risen, as he said. As the first light of dawn pierced the darkness this morning, it symbolized this victory of light over darkness, of life over death, and a love so powerful it shattered the chains of the grave. Because of this, we are freed from the bondage of sin and the sentence of death that sin brings because Jesus embraced the excruciating agony of the cross and traversed the shadowy valley of death only to emerge in resplendent victory, declaring freedom and hope for all who belong to him 
and the promise of eternal life, a gift of grace we could never earn nor repay. Let our celebration today, Lord, mirror the deep, heartfelt joy of your Son's resurrection and the peace that passes all understanding. Fortify our faith, embolden our witness, and intensify our love for you and for one another. Through tears of joys and shouts of jubilation, in the precious and most powerful name of our risen Lord, we pray. And Lord, as we pray corporately together now, we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. This is the reading of the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as the grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, 
Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. And what a joy to give back to that who gave us everything, including life. If our ushers will come forward, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather on this radiant Easter morning, our hearts rejoice in the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are reminded of the words spoken by Jesus himself. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he die. In the knowledge of such boundless love and the ultimate sacrifice, we come before you with our own humble offerings, fully aware that no gift could ever match the magnitude of what Christ has done for us. Our gifts today are a token of our deep gratitude and love, a mere reflection of the infinite grace we've received through Jesus' triumphant victory over the grave. Let these offerings be a testament to our ongoing commitment to live in the light of your grace, to share the message of hope, and to extend your kingdom through all of earth. May our giving reflect our profound thankfulness for the unmerited favor we've received through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Lord, would you now bless these gifts, multiply them according to your divine wisdom, and use them to bring comfort, hope, and healing to those in need. May our act of giving always be rooted in the recognition of the sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us living our lives as a continuous thank you to our Savior. In his holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Choir, please come forward and we'll continue with the celebration. As the choir is coming forward, in the middle of the choir anthem, we're going to ask that you stand. Watch Pastor Womack, and he will motion for you to stand and join us. The words will be on the screens. And then please remain standing until the anthem is concluded with the choir.
Thank you, and please be seated. As the choir is returning to their seats, I just want to observe the, the front of the church doesn't always look this way every week. And I want to thank Linda Story and her team, uh, which Joey, Joey helped out big time over here. Yeah, and, uh, and we just appreciate everybody who contributed to making this the, the beautiful church that it is. I think, personally, that's not bias at all, but I think, personally, <laughs> this is the prettiest church in America. But <laughs> And I thank everybody who contributes towards making it that way. If you'd pull out from your bulletin a sheet that says, pray for on the top, and look down there, I'm sure that everybody here has folks for which they would like prayer, and so we would invite you to pray silently uh, as, uh, as we go to prayer. And um, if not, if you just are fresh out of things for which to pray, this sheet will help you. And so uh, scan down there, maybe pick out two or three of these for which you'd like to pray, and then I'll conclude us after a time. Let's go to God silently in prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of coming into your presence, and it's because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that we have that great and precious privilege. God, we come boldly to you today, not because we deserve to be in your presence, but because of Christ, he has paved the way for us to be before you in prayer now, and we come today to present to you our needs, our desires, our hopes, our expectations, and we thank you that we come before you, hopefully knowing that you hear our requests and that you answer prayer, whether yes, no, or maybe, God, you answer our prayer. We thank you that the heavens are open to us because of Jesus. And now, God, we would, we would make our prayer. We make our prayer for those uh, who are in leadership positions across America, we pray for them that they might make good and wise decisions and that they would seek the counsel of our, our helper, the Holy Spirit, as, uh, as they make decisions that affect the world. God, we pray that, uh, that you would lead them and guide them in very obvious and specific ways. We pray for those who are protecting our freedoms across the world. We pray for those men and women who have made extraordinary sacrifices in order to keep us safe, and for their families who have sacrificed quite a bit as well. We pray for them as well. And now, God, we pray for those who are struggling with illnesses. We pray that you might keep them healthy and strong. God, we pray that you would, uh, for those who uh, need uh, your presence and your healing touch, we pray for that. And for, for each and every one of these, God, we pray that you would draw near to them, that they would sense your presence and be strengthened and comforted because of it. We pray for the good ministries with which we're associated, God, and we pray that you might bless them this day. And we pray that uh, as they continue in their ministries, Christ would be glorified, your church expanded, and this world a better place. Thank you, God, for the privilege of prayer. Now bless our pastor as he comes and brings your word to us. Lord, today we would see the Lord Jesus Christ. We make our prayer in his name. Amen. Thank you so much, soon to be Dr. Anderson. Indeed, it is beautiful up here. Thank you, Linda, Jack, and Joey, and any others that helped. This is absolutely wonderful. Also, I want to mention today and give thanks for our wonderful choir. You know, Thursday night I left here. I know we didn't go to heaven, but I felt like we were standing at the gates when they got through singing. When I surveyed the wondrous cross, I was moved absolutely to tears. 
And uh, so it is with mixed emotions that I say today that uh, Gordon and Carol will be leaving us for a time as they'll be going to North Carolina, but that's only with the understanding that they remember the way back and will be back with us in the months to come. But we so appreciate you and the music ministry of this church and uh, all of you who participate in that. Wow. And so today, here we are, Mark chapter 16, the final chapter marking not the end, but a glorious beginning. And that is the reason we rejoice as Christians, because in this life, nothing is about the end. It's everything about the beginning, all because of what happened on this day so long ago. Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And when they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth? He was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word. Because you know what? The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Amen. Astounding, shocking, amazing discoveries. We think of Neil Armstrong stepping off a ladder onto the surface of the moon. We think of Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492, and suddenly people began to realize that the earth was not flat after all, or at least most have come to realize that. And then, of course, there is the shocking discovery that food which tastes good is not good for you. (laughs) Gene and Greg, I had to have a poke there. It's not always pleasant, but it is often shocking when things turn out not to be as we think they will be. And that is one of the reasons why this passage of Scripture and all the resurrection passages bear the marks of historical authenticity. Because the people who discovered the grave to be empty on that first day of the week were absolutely not expecting it. It's astounding. Jesus had told them throughout the course of his ministry, paraphrasing, I have to go to Jerusalem. I will suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders and will be put to death. But on the third day, I will rise again. Mark repeats it no less than three times. And if you appreciate the gospel according to Mark, which was likely recorded by Mark as the gospel was proclaimed by Peter in Rome a few decades after the events happened, you know that Mark is very economical with his words. This is not a lengthy book. He keeps things short and concise. And the fact that he repeats three times Jesus saying that I must die but will rise again means undoubtedly that Jesus said it over and over again. I will rise again. I will rise again. I will rise again. And yet, having suffered and died and being placed in that ignominious grave on that Sunday morning when the Sabbath was over, at the earliest possible moment, women with spices in hand were ready to go to the grave not to see an empty tomb, but to anoint the body which lay within. No one expected Jesus to rise. And yet they went, following their hearts more than their heads. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Mary Magdalene was there first. We know that from the gospel accounts and narratives. There are repeated visitations. And again, one of the evidences of authenticity is that the writers of the New Testament didn't get their stories together. They didn't sit down and consistently come up with the same account. What we have are accurate tellings of the same event. 
just as if you might look at a precious jewel from one facet to the other and can see something different in every aspect of it, but you're still looking at the same precious gem. And so they are telling the same story from their own perspective, and all of it bears marks of authenticity that these are eyewitness reports. These are not the fanciful wishes of those who thought Jesus might be alive. And, un, you know, not, not like Bart Ehrman, the skeptic who held forth at UNC for years as a Bible scholar, quote, unquote. These were not mournful hallucinations. How is it that they could have hallucinated and even 500 people at one time had the same hallucination and they looked down at us for believing miracles? No. They went to that grave with every intent and purpose of anointing that body lovingly, caringly, and with concern, but it was a dead body that they expected to see. And so emotional were they that they had made no preparation whatsoever to even access the grave. This huge, heavy stone lay at its entrance. Those women couldn't move it. It would have taken many men to have removed that closing from the opening. And it was only as they were going that somebody said, Oh, yeah, how are we going to get in there? Are you with me? Do you see how this has every mark of being an actual account of people? who intended to do something but having no idea how they were going to do it. And so on that first day of the week, there they were, prepared to do something they didn't know how they could do. And yet out of love, they were prepared to anoint the dead body of the Lord who loved them. Jesus' closest followers fully expected to find his body in the tomb on that Sunday morning. You know, spices were expensive. It's not like they got together and said, you know, he said he was going to rise again, but just in case, let's go out and pay an arm and a leg for all of these expensive items and take them to the grave. Just in case that bears no resonance and rationality. And, of course, they go at the earliest possible hour. Now, if they were expecting a resurrection, somebody could have said, let's give it a little time. Remember what he said. Maybe we'll wait till, oh, let's give it till noon or maybe the afternoon and We can do it then, but there's none of that either. They go at daylight, the first possible moment that they were allowed to travel following the Sabbath. Remember, the Sabbath began at sundown. It concluded at sunrise. So they go at the earliest possible moment. There's no expectation of there being a resurrection. Yes, these accounts bear the marks of authenticity. Being so anxious to get there, making no plan to move the stone, they were frightened. You know, one of the earliest skeptics who was opposed to Christianity, a Roman writer, said that the reason he disbelieved it is because the earliest accounts said that women were the earliest eyewitnesses. And he said, everyone knows that women are hysterical and couldn't have reported the truth. (laughs) That's what he said. Do you know women were not even allowed to testify in court? Testimony was not admissible. They were not credible for such a thing. And so what writer in the first century in his right mind would have attributed the earliest eyewitness accounts to women? If these things were made up as they tell us on all of those PBS specials and other things that we read and in, uh, you know, in reputable literature and otherwise coming out of some of our institutions of higher learning, if these were just billboards, advertisements, compiled stories to try to convince people to believe a certain thing, They would not have written it this way. The point is, while the testimonies of these women may not have been admissible in court, they nevertheless testified to the truth, and these accounts bear the marks of authenticity to prove it. Yes, they were frightened. Any of us would have been. Male or female, we would have been hysterical. To go to a grave expecting to find a dead body there, and and instead there's an angel, or as Luke says, there's two angels. Proclaiming his resurrection, we would have been scared out of our wits too. And so they were. But they saw something. They saw an empty grave. Yes, these uh, narratives defy attempts to organize them. You know, scholars have really struggled through the years to try to overlay and come up with a, a consistent narrative of the events, and it's very difficult. 
that's the way it is with eyewitness testimony. So I'm told by smart attorneys, and we have those here in our church. And, you know, I remember, uh, I remember it was Chuck Colson, of course, who was uh, one of the uh, uh, main characters in the Watergate affair in the early 1970s, being a personal counsel to President Richard Nixon. And he said, you know, he became convinced about the truth of the resurrection because he learned from Watergate that you couldn't get 10 guys to agree to anything. He said they couldn't get their story straight about what happened on that day back in 1972, let alone could you have had all of these witnesses, as Paul says, 500 at one time could have gotten their story together like this. So even though the details defy all attempts to organize them concisely, they nevertheless all bear the truth. And so here they are at the tomb, expecting to see Jesus, but rather see this, you know, they don't even call him an angel. You know, if this had been written later, it would have been all dressed up, and we would have been told the detail, but the women are just telling what they saw. He was a young man. That's what he looked like to us, sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they're alarmed. They're scared out of their wits. This is a shocking discovery. What was supposed to be there is not there, and something that they never expected to be there is there. And he's telling them, what are you doing here? Luke says, why are you looking for the living? Or why are you looking, yeah, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why do we do that? We're still about that today, aren't we? Country song, remember it? Looking for love in all the wrong places. That's humanity. That's what we do. We're trying to fulfill, we're trying to fill in that God-shaped blank. As the unbeliever Aldous Huxley was even forced begrudgingly to say, that God-shaped blank or void that is within us, trying to fill that. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for love in all of the wrong places? Christ is not here. He's not in the grave. He's risen. And I want you to consider something else, and this goes beyond my own ability to convey it. But something I've been reading this past week in my beloved uh, systematic theology, Professor Doug Kelly's um, second volume on theology, that here is an historic event that is unlike any other. You know, when I was growing up, I loved hearing my grandparents and others tell stories about the old days. I remember my grandfather telling about Armistice Day. When the newspaper in, off in Waynesville received a telegram, within hours of the Armistice that was arrived at on the 11th of November, at the 11th hour in 1918, within hours, a telegram came blazing through the newspaper office in Waynesville, and church bells began to ring from one end of town to the other. And everyone knew the meaning, and women were dancing, and people were celebrating. And for years after that, they celebrated Armistice Day. Now, today it's Veterans Day. Nobody remembers Armistice Day. It's, it's fallen away into the, into the dust of history. And I remember later generations, and there are some here who remember Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th. It was always a day of commemoration. On Friday, Edith Wissenhunt went home to be with the Lord, wife of one of my closest friends I've ever had on the face of this earth, Bud Wissenhunt, veteran of World War II, beloved Elizabeth, left us to go home to be with the Savior. Her brother Rufus, who I remember singing with in the choir, was in Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941, when the bombs fell. And for three weeks, his parents had no word. Mr. and Mrs. Summero didn't know if their son was alive or dead for three weeks. And they waited, and they waited, and waited until finally a message came that Rufus was alive. Edith told me that in the nursing home, the last visit that I made with her. And we'll lay her to rest next week. It was on the 10th of May, 2013, in the afternoon, it was a Friday, when his sister-in-law, Mildred, called me and said, Patrick, something's happened to Bud. I was already going through the back door. He was in the garden. She said, there's an ambulance outside and people are standing around. I rushed up the street and I still remember falling in the grass on my knees and I cried. There was Bud the man who, when I was in the 10th grade,
took it on himself as a mission to go after this, this teenage boy about to get his driver's license who had every potential of going off the rails. And Bud Wissenhunt, veteran of Patton's Third Army, came after me like he was back on mission to rescue the 101st from Bastogne. And Sunday after Sunday, Pat, I'm saving you a seat in the choir. Pat, I can't wait till you're up there singing with me in the choir. I was a 10th grader. I had no interest in singing in the choir. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> but you know what? I started coming under conviction. I realized I was going to get my driver's license, and somehow I knew the Lord was going to hold me accountable for that. I was going to have freedom that I didn't have before, and what was I going to do with it? And what excuse did I not have to go sit with Bud in the choir? So I started singing in the choir, and that meant being there on Sunday evening, and then that meant Wednesday night, and then the first thing I know, Bud was showing me all the light switches and how to clean the boiler, and by the 12th grade, I was a deacon in my home church. <laughs> What congregation in its right mind would ordain a 17-year-old to be a deacon? And there I was with Bud every Sunday. And when I wound up back at Hazelwood as pastor, sitting with him in the fellowship hall one day, opened up his Bible, and he had a bulletin in there for my ordination service. And he said, Pat, I pray the Lord would let me live long enough for you to be my pastor. So when the EMT asked me, can you possibly identify the gentleman here? I wiped my eyes and I stood to attention. And I said, this is Sergeant Murray Ray Wissenhunt, veteran of Patton's Third Army, wounded on the battlefields of France and decorated for valor. And I'm here to report that he's absent with leave and home with the Lord. That's why the resurrection matters. We're not talking about a mere historical event that has faded into insignificance with the passing of time. We're talking about something that has an ongoing, dynamic impact in the here and now. I may come to the realization that George Washington was in fact the first president of the United States. And that's a great realization to have. But it doesn't do anything for me except increase my knowledge. But when I come to the realization that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he is the ever-living Son of God, that his indestructible life, even though they nailed him to a cross, and even though he suffered in the darkest hours this earth has ever seen, I know there's a solar eclipse coming, but don't let that fool you. There was no solar eclipse that day from the, from the sixth hour until the ninth. At least at Calvary, there was nothing but darkness. And the Son of God, in the deepest, darkest moments of those hours, cried the words of dereliction, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And for the first and only time in the course of history, a human being endured the second death before he endured the first. Coming under the wrath of God for the one who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God. And in the darkness of those hours, he endured the hell and he endured the wrath that we deserve and he got a victory that we could never earn. And believing that means everything. It's not just becoming more knowledgeable about a past event. It's about buying into a reality that has an ongoing, dynamic, present effect. There is nothing else in history, nothing that rises to that level. Everything else fades into the dust. But the light of Christ and his glorious resurrection is that ongoing reality about which we will be talking in the ages to come. For we will see the one, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, but a lamb who has risen, whose wounds will still be visible in his hands and feet. The wound in his side, he didn't swoon on the cross. Don't let anybody try to convince you that he just passed out. 
How could a man beaten to within an inch of his life with a crown of thorns crushed down upon his brow, flogged, scourged, until, as one scholar said, the bones in his back would have stood out like white marble columns, and then with iron spikes driven through his hands and feet, he breathed his last, and a Roman centurion thrust a spear through his side, through his lungs and heart, until blood and water flowed forth, he died that day when he said, it is finished to tell us die. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He breathed his last, and he was dead. His body was lifeless, no breath left in him. There was no swooning on the cross, but how could a man having endured so much, placed in a cold, dark tomb with a stone weighing tons over the entrance, could have managed to stagger out of a burial cloth bearing 75 pounds worth of spices, managed to come out of that, get a stone rolled out of the way, limp into Jerusalem, and somehow convince people that he had risen from the dead. You think I believe in a miracle? Please, let your powers of reason at least operate on this scale as the Holy Spirit enables you. But that would be an utter impossibility. The resurrection of Christ is a foundational, non-negotiable element of saving faith. If you do not believe the testimony of the scriptures regarding the resurrection of the Son of God, then what basis do you have to believe anything in them? You want to talk about going to heaven? What heaven is there to go to other than the one that is revealed to us in scripture? But alas, if we undercut its veracity by denying the resurrection, what reason do we have to believe in a heaven at all? What reason do we have to believe that we exist at all? I might be an illusion up here in front of you right now. Don't think about that too much. <laughs> you see, the same supposed scholars who would cause us to doubt or disbelieve the events on this page would nevertheless like to grasp at some things that are in Scripture and say, oh, it's okay to believe that, but why? If this is a lie... What basis do you have to believe any of the rest of it? Only a resurrected Christ can give everlasting life. I love to read about George Washington. I have nothing against the man at all. He wasn't perfect. He's one of my heroes. But he's not doing anything for me right now. Nor is Harriet Tubman, nor are any other host of people who have done great things through the course of history. But Christ lives in me. He's my life my hope, and he's the power of the resurrection, not a mere historical event. Having repeatedly declared that God would raise him from the dead, he demonstrated that truth by rising from the dead. Every primary source of our faith proclaims the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no New Testament, there is no church, there are no early believers. They went to their graves, many of them persecuted, killed, not because they believed a lie, but because they absolutely believe that Jesus is alive. The resurrection is as vital as the crucifixion to the New Testament. Any time the crucifixion is proclaimed, it always is done so in light of the resurrection. And any time the resurrection is, is, is declared, it's done so on the basis that here was a man who died in order to be resurrected. You cannot separate the two. Angels, God's direct messengers, proclaimed it repeatedly. If Christ is not risen, then God has lied. And Paul says, if Christ is not risen, then we are a people utterly without hope and to be pitied above all. Yes, you can believe it. You better believe it. It's essential to life and life everlasting. Those women were confused and they were scared. They were alarmed. They were shocked. But by the end of the day, Jesus had shown himself to be alive. To his disciples and even to Thomas a week later who refused to believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the glorious resurrection chapter, as Paul makes his arguments, he says, Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I preach to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. You see, if these things weren't true, there are plenty of eyewitnesses that could have said, you can read that all you want to, but let me tell you what really happened no possibility because the truth was being conveyed, corroborated by these witnesses. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all to one untimely born he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because he testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. But if the dead are not raised... Not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. Isn't it astounding that at the moment that Jesus died, there was an earthquake? Rocks were broken in two. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. That, that piece of cloth that was said to be as thick as a man's hand is wide, ripped in twain from top to bottom, gaining us access even into the Holy of Holies. And the graves, many graves outside of Jerusalem, broke open. Matthew tells us, so that after Jesus was raised, many of those saints were resurrected from the graves and went into the holy of city and saw people. How'd you like to have been there for that? Isn't that one of those moments where we were sitting there, more information on this? Now it's important, Matthew tells us, while the graves were torn open at the moment that Christ died, the bodies did not come forth until Christ had been resurrected. Why? Because he is and always shall be the first fruits of those who slept. And so on a Wednesday night in a hospital room with J.C. Tucker, a man, a dear friend of mine, Mother's Day weekend, 2005, was coming up. And the doctor had said because circulation had been cut off to the lower extremities of his body, he only had days left to live. I was with the family when the doctor gave the word. I had to go down to the waiting room area and tell his son when he came in he was completely unaware of his father's perilous condition. And then when I was saying goodbye to J.C., I was shocked and disturbed to discover that the doctor had not yet told him, and J.C. knew that something was wrong. Pastor, what's wrong? What did the doctor say? I've seen the movies. I've never wanted to be that pale preacher in a dark suit standing at the door bearing bad news. I figure the doctors get paid for that. That's their job. <laughs> but J.C. with tears in his eyes looked at me and he said, Preacher, you never lied to me. I want to hear it from you. I said, J.C., I'm not a doctor. But the doctor says you only have a couple of days to live because the circulation has been cut off and your kidneys are failing. You're going home. And he took my hand and he gripped it and he looked at me and he said, Well, if that's what the Lord has for me, I'm ready to go. And I reckon we'll see each other again. Can you pray with me? I believe with all my heart I'll see him again. Hundreds of funerals I've attended in my life and hundreds that I've preached. J.C. or Junior 
Reinhardt in second grade, my friend left me at the end of the school year, so proud that his daddy preached out of the Bible. We played on the playground and ate lunch together, and he left us. Patty Clark in the fifth grade, Uncle Lawrence when I was eight years old, Aunt Ruth, Uncle Porter, Aunt Nett, used to stand beside her bedside and tell her Jerry Clower stories. Ravaged with cancer and the treatments, there was my bald-headed, dear, great aunt lying in the bed laughing and chuckling and saying, ain't God good. I'm going to see her again. And Aunt Mary and my papa, the first funeral I preached, and Annette. Married in August to my friend Mike. Those of us who were ushers at her wedding after a tragic car crash in December with the same men who bore her casket to the grave. I'll see her again because of faith in Jesus. You can talk to me about myths and fables all you want, but I'm telling you right now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact, and he ever lives because his life is indestructible, and we are here today because there is hope in him. And I simply want to remind you of what you already know. That's what I've done in the last 30 minutes. Tell you what you already know and encourage you that Christ our Lord lives. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name and we thank you for the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. That however long we have in this life, we know that it's just the beginning when our faith is in your beloved son. For there is all eternity waiting for us purchased for us by one who is perfect and sinless, whose atoning death is effective to anyone who trusts in him, even a lowly sinner like me. Thank you, Father, for all that is ours. And thank you that up from the grave he arose. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Rise, church, and let's sing it.
And so may the grace of our resurrected and ever-living Lord Jesus Christ be with and abide with you all, both now and forevermore. And everyone said together, Amen. Amen.